Hey everybody, Keith Denner here from Fly Miata, and I'm here today to talk about brake hydraulic systems. This is going, not going to be a video on what is the best height, the best brake fluid to use in your Willwood calipers. I'm sorry if that was the, what you tuned in for. What we're going to talk about today is how a hydraulic system works in terms of sizing, what's the math behind it, the interesting nerdy stuff. Not the boring, you know, use part X if you want part Y kind of stuff. That's, and we talk about that all the time. We did a previous video that talked about uh, performance brake systems, that talked about brake fluids and where the heat goes and sort of thing. I would recommend you check that out if you want to find out a little bit more about the braking itself. But today we're going to talk about the actual hydraulics. What makes the brakes go on when you press on the pedal? Um, one of the, here's an interesting thing from the factory manual for a 1990 Miata, and this applies to most of the NAs and MVs. If you put 44 pounds of force on the pedal, if you step on that pedal with 44 pounds of force, you're gonna generate something about 750 to 780 PSI of pressure in those lines. And that pressure comes from somewhere. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, is where does that come from and what do we can do with it and what does the sizing mean and what does this mean in terms of caliper choice and oh my God, so many interesting things. So, I'm gonna to start today with some visual aids. As you can see, I have, I have rated the toy box for this one. Um, this is Travis, this is myself here. We even have little little doppelgangers on here. But this is gearing. Um, obviously, most of us know how gearing works. The big gear has more teeth. It turns more slowly than the little one. And they have a, they have a very specific ratio. In this case, they're, uh, for every seven times the big one goes around, or sorry, every three times the big one goes around, the little one goes around seven times. And it works two, it works two ways. You can either speed something up by attaching gears this way, or you can drive the little one and you can slow it down. So this is fairly understandable stuff. Kind of fun to watch too. Um, but what this also means is we're also multiplying or dividing force. So if we're putting say one pound of force on this thing, or say three pounds, let's make the numbers easier. If we're three pounds of force on this thing, we're gonna get seven pounds of force at the other end of, this, of the lever on the other one. That's what this does. This is multiplication or division of force. And I'm going to apologize to all the physicists and engineers out there. I'm going to play a little loose with some of my uh, some of my terms, like pounds of force and that kind of thing. I will forget occasionally. My goal here is to get the concepts into play. So, if you are currently almost about to stroke out because I used the force the term force uh, incorrectly, I apologize for that. Um, we're looking at concepts here. So yeah, this these things basically you're trading speed or distance for power or force, um, and that is basically how gearing works. And we all, this is very easy to understand. This is how your transmission works. Um, there's a lot of things in a car that use this, but you don't think about it being used in the braking system. But this is a direct analog of how hydraulics work. So there's another way to do this. I haven't quite got up to my seven turns yet, have I? Come on. Yeah, anyway. No, this also applies to levers. We need to get little Travis, little space Travis to turn around and look at this. There we go. Um, this is a lever that's, that's attached here. And if we look at the ends of the lever, this part goes further than this part. And you also have the same thing with force. And this actually happens to be the same ratios as those gears do. This is seven units. In this case, each hole is a unit. This is three units. And if you look, I put some little markers on here. If I start off here, this is lined up with a marker. I swing it over this way. This is lined up with a marker. This one goes seven times for every three. This one, th seven units for every three this unit goes. So basically, you're gonna end up with that same multiplier in there. If you put um, three pounds of force on here, you'll end up with, uh, sorry, yeah, three pounds of force on here, you'll end up with seven on here because you're multiplying by the, uh, by the lever that's on here. Again, leverage is something we understand. If you're having trouble getting something to move, you get a longer pry bar, you put a cheater pipe over the end of your jack, you know how that works, stuff breaks. Um, it works both halfway up the lever or on the other side of the pivot. These two little guys are both the same distance from the pivot and they both work the same way. So this is basically a direct equivalent to this. It's just gearing. You're trading off distance for power multiplication, force multiplication, whatever you wanna call it. And the same thing applies to hydraulics. This is a fun little thing I've put together. This is a big piston. This is a little piston. If I move this a small distance, this one moves a big distance. I'll do this the other way. If I move this one a big distance, this one moves a small distance, but it pushes really hard. And this is the brake system right here. This is what we're dealing with. If I actually, and this would be fun, everyone here get in line, you can try this after class. Um, if I'm trying to hold the big one down while I push on this, it's actually pretty much impossible for me to do. 
because I've got so much mechanical leverage here. It's about a six to one ratio between these two. Um, so much mechanical leverage or, or hydraulic leverage to lift this thing up. And this is what brake systems work off, is this difference in, in force versus travel um, based on, in this case, piston sizes. So let's see how some of this stuff applies to a braking system. We'll start right here. This is a clutch pedal, but whatever. Brake, brake pedals and clutch pedals, same thing. Um, this is a clutch pedal from, I don't know, NA or MB Miata, something I pulled off the shelf. And you can see that this is where you put your foot, obviously, we all know this part. And this is the push rod that, that activates the master cylinder. And you can see it's attached part way up. There's, there's the pivot up here. Here's the uh, point where the push rod's attached. And here's where you stand. It's a 6.13 to one ratio. I got that number of the factory manual, six to one basically. So if I move this six inches, this push rod will only move one inch, but it will have six times the force. It's gonna multiply my force by six times. So right there, all of a sudden, your, uh, your 44 pounds of force, for example, here, has been multiplied by six on this one. On a brake pedal, it's actually four to one, 4.1 to one, but it's the same concept. I just didn't have a brake pedal sitting around. So that's the first part, there's our lever. We talked about those already. Next is our master cylinder. I just, I had a master cylinder on the shelf, so there you go, there's a master cylinder. And what a master cylinder looks like inside is this. It's got a push rod. It pushes in here, and that's that thing that's sticking out of the pedal. And you can't see it, there we go. And it's got a piston that moves up and down. So when you push on the push rod, back and forth, that piston moves forward and pushes fluid out. Or it pressurizes fluid, honestly, which is what's happening a lot of the time. There's not really movement, but you can think of it as movement. It gives you the right concept. So this is effectively what a master cylinder looks like. And then on the other end, in a caliper, you've got a piston as well. There's a piston in here. This is a four piston caliper, so it's got four pistons, but it's the same concept. These are basically just like the master cylinder, but turned around. Those are pistons. You put fluid in one side and they push out, they move in their little bore. So that's the fundamentals of what's going on when you step on your brakes. You've got a lever that's pushing on, on a master cylinder that is pushing fluid all through here and that is, that is applying to your brakes. And they're sized like this. The master cylinder's little, the brakes are big, and so you get a lot of travel and you gear it down into a big stump puller of a gear that puts all sorts of force into your brake pads. Can't see it going very far, but trust me, it is moving. This is a fun thing. I just put this together today. I've been playing with it. Um, that is simple green, not real brake fluid, by the way. So if there is a if there is a spill, don't fear for my life. Um, okay, so you can actually take all of these ratios and you can figure out how much pressure there's going to be on the pads based on how much pressure you put on the ends of uh, you put on the pedals, given the sizes of everything. So what does this mean in terms of working with your brake system? Oh, I should, I should talk about the actual ratio on these things. If you want to figure out the ratio of movement versus force multiplication, it's about the, it's about the area of the pistons, which is, you know, pi r squared. I'm sure you remember that one from high school. Uh, but basically, a, um, a bigger piston will move, you know, if this is the one, the input, it'll move a lot of fluid, but it's going to be hard to work. A small piston will move it slowly, but it'll be easier to push. Because you can basically look at if you put, say, if you put 100 pounds, well, if you put 100 pounds of force on this and it has one square inch of area, you're going to end up with 100 PSI of pressure. If you put 100 pounds into a two square inch, you'll end up with only 50 pounds per square inch because you've got two square inches, 100 pounds on it, 50 divided by, or 100 divided by two, 50. So that's basically how your multiplication works. I'm sure the comments are full of all sorts of high school science teachers who are just going, oh my God, stop talking. But there you go, that's what we're dealing with. Um, so what does this mean in terms of your brake system? Well, it means you can use some of this multiplication to change the brake torque at each wheel. You know, if you want more rear braking, you can affect that by either increasing the amount of pressure on the back brakes, which is what's done with your messing around with proportioning valves, you're usually changing the pressure up there, or you can do it by adjusting the size of the pistons in the back brakes. Bigger pistons means you're gonna get more force in there, but it's gonna take more fluid to move them, so your pedal's gonna be a little softer because you, oh, you can't get away from that trade-off of travel versus force um, versus multiplication. So, for example, the sport tech cars. This is a, a caliper off, I think it's off an NA. Um, well, it is off an NA, I, th I think it might be a 1.6, but whatever. It's got a one and a quarter inch uh, rear piston. Um, the sport brakes, they had bigger pistons in them so you could basically squeeze harder. And, uh, and they were one and three eighths, I think. So, because there's a square in there, pi r squared, um, 
the uh, the amount of force goes out much quicker than you'd think with a change in diameter. It's amazing how many of these talks turn into pressures. And I'm all about pressure. I hadn't realized that until we started doing this. So if you are, oh, we'll look at this. We'll look at these. Um, this is a four piston, obviously. Uh, it's got, and I, I don't, this is for a replacement for a front. The front pistons in a stock Miata caliper are two inches in diameter. This one, in order to keep the same overall size, and so you don't end up with all sorts of jacked up portioning, you don't end up also like a really squishy uh, brake pedal, they are sized so that the, uh, the piston area works out the same. This is one and three eighths. If you do the math, it works out to very close to three square inches of area, which is basically where a two square inch, or two inch, Piston ends up. Run the math, it's there, but effectively twin one three eighths are equivalent to one two incher. And here's a kind of a fun thing on an opposed piston caliper like this, you only take into account one side because each of these is moving half as far, you're only doing half the work, so you only pay attention to one side. On a sliding caliper like this, it's only got one piston, you do that. So one piston equal to two piston. That one can catch you out. Um, so you want more front brake power? You can put in a, a um, you can put in a caliper with bigger pistons, but you've got to watch that trade off. You've got to trade off the distance, how soft your pedal is going to be. Now, there's one place where you can cheat on this, um, and that is the booster. The booster is simply a multiplier. I don't have a booster here, but you know what they look like. They're just a big tin can. There's a diaphragm inside them. It uses vacuum to take your input, take your pressure, and multiply it by something and give you more. Um, in the early Miatas, up to uh, when was it? I think 2001 or so. They were all basically the same booster, and they were roughly a 4.8 to 1 boost. So if you put 100 pounds of pressure into it, you got 480 pounds out the other side. And that just means you didn't have to push as hard on the uh, on the pedal to get the same pressure at the pads, the same force at the pads. Again, messing up with the guys who were obsessed with uh, with units. I apologize for that. Um, now, boosters come with a bit of a trade-off. There's some feel changes and that sort of thing, but frankly, that's what they do. They're just a straight multiplier. Unlike the other multipliers where you lose, we have to trade off travel for that extra force, um, you sort of get it for free. So they're kind of a get, a, get it a jail free card. Miatas come with at least three, well, NA and MB Miatas come with at least three different boosters, three I can think of, um, that will get you different ratios depending on what you want to do, but you got to watch out because they have different, different mounting points on them. So do we have any questions, Travis? Well, we have one. He yeah. wants to make sure that he's got the concept right. Sure. It says you press the stoppy lever to push the slow juice into the pad squeezer. Is that right? That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good, actually. <laughs> the pad squeezer, yes. Yes, you press the stoppy lever, and then this thing happens. I go this way, doesn't it? Um, and then, yes, the, the pad squeezer. That's, that's good. Thank you for that. I might have to write that one down. We'll put that in our catalog in our braking system so you can, you can understand what everything is. I'm going to start changing calipers to pad squeezers. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's basically what we're doing. I can see if I can hold this down. I'm going to blow out a line if I'm not careful. I can't hold this thing down. It's still going up. This is the reason, actually, it's not working that much because there's some air in the lines. And this is why we use hydraulic fluid because fluid being a liquid is effectively incompressible. It will not pressurize. The fluid itself won't squeeze under pressure. Air does, um, that's what compressed air is. And, uh, and so you can't really use air in a braking system because otherwise when you put all this force in one end, the air will just go and compress and it won't do any work on the other side. Um, that's why if you, boil your, if you boil your brake fluid and you end up with air in your brakes, you're going to spend all this work you're doing, all this multiplication, all this pressure you're putting on here and levers, and all you're going to do is compress the air inside your brake fluid. You can see I've got some air in, some air in here. All you're going to do is take that bubble, and you're just going to compress that. And that's why your brakes get all squishy if you've overheated the fluid, boiled it, because it gets air pockets in like that. And that's why you have to bleed brakes to get rid of that. Um, if you have overheated your brakes and you have a soft pedal, so that you've got a double pump or it's, it's a long pedal, that's your problem. You have air in there and you need to bleed that out. The reason we bleed out brakes, and we talked about this in a previous video, the reason we bleed our brake fluid or flush our brake fluid on a regular basis is because this stuff absorbs water. Well, this isn't brake fluid, it's simple green, but if it was brake fluid, brake fluid absorbs water out of the air, it loves water. And uh, the more water absorbs, the lower the temperature at which it boils, the more likely you are to do that where you, have a, where you boil it. You end up with air bubbles, and then you discover that usually at a bad time that your brakes don't really work as well as you kind of like them to. So that's that's preventative maintenance. But once you've got that bubble in there, you've got to you've got to bleed it out. 
we have any more questions? This was just kind of, this is the thing, I, I, I love breaking systems, I love the way they work, the way you sort of get something for free, the way the, uh, the pad squeezers uh, can make such a difference. Um, and you can imagine, this is, going back to pad squeezers, you can, you can see why caliper stiffness is so important because it's got hundreds of pounds of force going this way, hundreds of pounds of force going this way, and the whole thing is trying to open up. Um, so that's why pad, or why caliper stiffness is really important. Um, you know, the original Willwood Dynalite, Dynapro 6s didn't have a bridge bolt through here. Um, and so they were, they were quite sloppy. You could feel the whole caliper flexing under hard use. Um, they added a bridge bolt uh, in the casting. I don't have one here to show you, but it increased the stiffness of the, of the uh, caliper dramatically. And all of a sudden, you know, instead of using all that brake force to squeeze your pedal around, you squeeze your caliper around, you're using it directly to squeeze your pads in your pad squeezer. And uh, yeah, that's why stiff calipers are good. We have a question. We do. Upon that line, um, the question is, am I correct that the six-piston caliper applies the same PSI on the pads and rotor as a single or four-piston caliper and that extra braking power comes from the extra rotor and pad area? That's effectively it, yes. Um, you've got the same pressure being applied at the pad. PSI of the pad on the actual... Uh, on the actual rotor itself is going to be lower because you're putting the same pressure on it but it's got a bigger pad but it's got that bigger area so there's a lot more pad doing the work um, so yes effectively uh, the reason you're getting the big thing you get out of a six piston is not so much you do get more braking torque out of it but the bigger difference is you've got a much bigger heat sink that huge pad can absorb a lot more heat um, and heat as we've talked about earlier is a real enemy in braking systems um, now one thing that's actually interesting about the six pistons i wish i had one to show you because the pads, when you're, you know, the rotor's going around like this and the pads come in, they kind of get squeezed this way. And it's, it's the natural tendency. To have, and if you've ever had an old bike with, uh, with the old squeezy style brakes, you could actually look down and see those things pull forward whenever you put the brakes on. They, they'd sort of work like this. You had to, to pre-position them ahead of time. I was, I was a bike mechanic for years. Um, the uh, six piston calipers actually do that because the pads so long they have staggered bore sizes. They will have different sized pistons in different places to sort of compensate for the pad trying to go this way. They'll push harder on the front, and keep it flat. Um, it's actually a neat kind of piece of engineering, but it also means that you have to pay attention when you install those. They will have a left and a right. It's an important left and right. Otherwise, you're going you're gonna to end up with very bad pad wear, for example, if you get that backwards. I am making a mess with brake fluid. It's impossible to get the brake fluid out of something completely. But it's good simple grip. It's good uh, super blue, so there you go. Any more questions? No? Well, I thank you for, uh, this will be a fairly short uh, Facebook Live today. I thank you for your attention. This basically gave me an excuse to, uh, to get out the old um, technical Lego. And for those of you who are of a certain age, you might recognize these old colored gears. I use them because they're more visible. Um, they haven't been around for a while. But, uh, but yeah, give me an excuse to get out, to break out the Lego, to take it away from my little nephews. And um, yeah, I, I strongly recommend if you have access to a couple of syringes, this is really kind of fun. <laughs> Being able to play with this. It's like this is the most visible demonstration of how a uh, how a master and break or master and uh, and slave works. Uh, this works the same way in your clutch system, by the way. You know, your master cylinder, your slave cylinder, there's some multiplication going on in there so that you can actually push the pedal hard enough to release your uh, your clutch. We actually had a problem. The old uh, Westfield Miata based seven kit cars. Uh, they were designed to reuse a bunch of different stuff. You could just take a Miata donor, kind of like the Exocet, and build a, a seven style car out of it. But they screwed up the math on the brake pedal. So the brake of the clutch was one of the two pedals. I think it was the clutch. Um, they screwed up the math on it. The pivots were in the wrong place and you could not release the clutch. And they said, well, you just gotta get a different master cylinder. But clutch, Master cylinders in clutch sizes are a little difficult to find. We couldn't find one the right size. And so what we had to do is we actually just had to drill a hole in the clutch pedal and move the pivot to a different place to change the, uh, change the ratio. Um, the guys at Westfield never acknowledged that. They, there are a bunch of Westfields running around that don't work properly because their clutches don't release properly. But um, yeah, that was just a matter of knowing how the leverage works, knowing how the, uh, how the, the actual lever works, and just changing that. A question there, Travis. Maybe a little off topic, but um, someone wants to know what your thoughts are on manual brakes. Manual brakes. Basically, that's the brake without the magic booster in the middle. Um, 
Honestly, on a lot of street cars, I think it's an affectation. Uh, I can see it being useful on a on a race car. Uh, one thing about racers is that they will always take a very firm pedal with very little slop in it that takes a lot of pressure. They prefer that over a long pedal that feels soft. Um, a lot of street cars, like you get in a Volkswagen Golf or something like that, you'll feel, you jump in it, you touch the brakes, and it just kind of grabs hold really hard. You think, wow, this is strong brakes. And some of that is done by simply putting a really big booster in there, but some of it is done by allowing the pedal to go a long distance to give you lots of clamping force, the bad squeezer. Um, racers don't like that. They like the, the reassurance of hitting the brake pedal and being nice and firm and right away, and so they tend to bias towards big master cylinders. Um, you know, it's okay if you have to push a little harder because you're all full of adrenaline because you're on a racetrack anyway. Um, and that's, I think, where some of the preference for manual systems comes from. You do get a better feedback on it, and I have built cars with manual brakes. Um, I built a Lotus 7 replica myself years ago. And uh, on that car, I did use a manual brake setup, but I did change some of the ratios. Uh, it was based around a Miata system, but I did use some different master cylinder sizes. And I also used a, four, a six to one pedal instead of a four to one pedal to give myself some mechanical advantage. I'm not a big fan of simply taking a Miata and deleting the booster and bolting the master on there. Just, you've got to step on the pedal five times harder to get the same retardation unless you change out the master cylinder. And uh, on a street car, I think it's mostly done because it looks cool. And it's not, not my first choice. So, um, yeah, there are certain, certainly some places where they can be used, places where you don't need a lot of brake pressure. That uh, 7 I built uh, only weighed 1,200 pounds, so it didn't really need a lot of retardation to get it to slow down in a hurry. Um, my little Mini that's uh, right here beside Travis does not have a booster on it because, again, it doesn't weigh squat. Get my turkey hat put out there. Uh, it doesn't weigh anything, so it doesn't need a whole lot of help. Um, it's also got uh, disc, or drum brakes in it, which in the back, which are also technically very interesting in terms of they are self-energizing, but they are not used on Miata, so we are not going to talk about drum brakes today. We have another question, Travis. One last question. What about brake boosters and boosted applications? If you track it, you'll almost never get the manifold to vacuum. So brake boosters work off engine vacuum. That's, that's the power they use for your multiplier. So if you do not have a vacuum source for your brake booster, it will not boost your brakes. Um, so there's a check valve in there. This is a, if you ever feel up the, you feel the line that goes into your brake booster and it's got a, it's got a lump in it, like a snake that swallowed something. Um, and there's a little arrow that's often on the, on the factory cars, I think it's even marked with a white mark. And that's a check valve so that the engine can suck basically suck air out of there, can create, it can pull a vacuum in the, in the booster, but say when you're full throttle and you don't have a vacuum in the intake manifold, it doesn't leak back out again, unless that check valve's broken. And so the question is here, what about boosted cars that never go into vacuum? And I, you do go into vacuum. The moment you lift off that throttle and you close the, uh, you close the throttle and you hear that blow off out, go psh, and you are applying the brakes with your foot off the gas, you are producing vacuum. Um, and if you are at any point not basically generating boost, you are creating vacuum. So. If you have a boosted car that's running around on the track and you're not able to keep your booster working, I think you've got a problem. It's not a fundamental problem because the car is boosted. Um, I think the problem is your check valve's not working or your booster is leaking or something like that because you do every time you are not actually in boost, you, have, you are pulling a vacuum and that should be helping out. Cars with really big cams um, can be a problem. And actually, here we go, the ND Miata has a built-in vacuum pump because the way that car works, if you own an ND, you've heard that terrible noise it makes on startup. The first 30 seconds, it's making this nasty ah, noise. At that point, it's got its throttle opened all the way and it's retarding its valve, its, um, its cam timing to bump as much heat as possible into the, into the uh, catalytic converter. And it'll do this at cruise sometimes too. You don't know it's doing it. Um, that's a very smart engine. It's doing all sorts of tricks. But when it's got that throttle plate all the way open, it's not generating any vacuum. So it cannot, uh, it cannot help the booster. So that car actually has a vacuum pump to sort of supplement the booster um, in those situations. So that when you first start the car up, you're the sort of person that jumps in your car, fires it up, heads down a mountain road, and immediately hits the brakes at the bottom of your super steep driveway, um, you may not have any vacuum yet. So it's got a little vacuum pump to help you out. And that's also something that's done on cars with really big camshafts, um, cars that don't pull a lot of vacuum. Um, my, my V8 Miata doesn't pull a whole lot of vacuum at idle. Uh, so. Again, it could use a vacuum pump if I was going to do that situation where I would go screaming down the mountain road at idle the entire way down. But when I close the throttle and decel, 
it pulls enough to, to give me a booster. I've never had to mess with that. I hope that answered the question. It was a little bit of an information dump there that, uh, that might have been too much, but short version, boosted cars should still be able to have brake assist on the track unless you've got some ridiculous camshaft in there. Anything else, Travis? No more questions. I hope this was interesting. I hope this was educational. I hope there's at least one person out there who's going, ah, oh, okay, okay, I get it. That's interesting. That's good. Um, it's kind of fun. If you go shopping on the Willwood website, for example, they have calipers listed specifically. They list the area of the caliper as one of the uh, one of the factors, one of the um, one of the attributes of the caliper. And the reason for that is so you can do your sizing. Um, I've I've done a custom brake setup for a Volkswagen Vanagon that had a very specific size booster and a very specific size. Um, master cylinder so I knew you know I had to hunt down a certain uh, a certain size caliper to make that fit there weren't very many options in that particular size this car behind me runs an MG pedal with a, a different MG booster and then Willwood master cylinders and then Miata calipers and you know there's a lot of math there to make sure that it worked okay and I started with the Miata numbers and it worked backwards okay so if it's a four to one caliper if it's a if this thing has a six to one um, pedal instead of a four to one pedal and the booster is a seven to one What do I need for a master cylinder size in order to get similar pressures at the uh, at the wheels? I wasn't calculating brake torques because I knew that at the wheels I had Miata based stuff So I just kind of worked back from there and I knew that with Miata's it worked and so Just a matter of a little bit of number crunching and the first stuff I bought worked because it's just a matter of ratios um, That's all it comes down to it's just gearing you just have to figure out this much goes in this much comes out And then you start adding stuff up on the system it doesn't matter if the multiplication is done at the pedal, it doesn't matter if it's done at the master um, or at the booster, you still end up with the same answer and you'll end up with the same result. We did have one question actually about line size. Does the size of the lines make a difference? I don't really think it does. Um, basically, that's just the thing that's transmitting the power or transmitting the force for you. Uh, the actual diameter of the line doesn't matter unless you're looking for basically a reservoir of more fluid, say trucks were the example used. I'm not familiar enough with trucks to know how big their, their lines are, but they may be using a large diameter line, so they've got a little more fluid near the caliper, so it's less likely to overheat. Um, big over the road semis, they use air brakes, totally different thing. They use pressure to release the brakes. Um, and so we're not, we're not going there, because they don't do this stuff. You can't unhook trailers when, they, when there's a closed hydraulic system in there, so we're not touching pneumatics. But yeah, the, the actual size of the line is not really critical. Um, and as you've probably figured out, if you can get the same ratio between input and output, it doesn't matter if they're both very small or both very big. You can multiply this one, make this one twice as big. In terms of area, this one twice as big, it'll have the same behavior, but it'll be moving more fluid. There's reasons to do that. Um, there's reasons not to do that, I'm sure. But uh, basically the industry has settled on certain more or less consistent sizes, so it gets if you try to get too far out of the norm, it gets weird. It's hard to find master cylinders with a certain size range. Whee! First time I tested this, I actually launched that thing across the room because I had to travel a little bit off. It was a little messy to do some cleanup. Again, if you've got a kid doing a science fair experiment, this would be a good science fair. It's, not, it's engineering, not science, but whatever. Okay, if you have any more questions, throw them in the comments. Um, we will do our best to answer them. Uh, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, um, there's a book by a guy called Keith Tanner called uh, How to Build a High Performance Mazda Miata. And it's got a lot of theory in it. It's got a lot of the sort of stuff we've been covering in these videos. Um, not so much buy part X to do part Y, but how does this stuff work? It's got listings of all the booster sizes in it. Um, it's got a lot of theory in terms of how the suspensions work, how the brakes work. And I personally really enjoy it. Of all my books I've written, it's my favorite one because it's just, I love this theory stuff. I love the reason for why things work the way they do. Once you understand that, you can figure out how to make it work the way you want it to. Um, not available from Fly Miata at the moment. We don't have any stock, um, but it is available from fine booksellers everywhere. And uh, it will be available from Fly Miata hopefully very soon. So that's about all I've got going on. Unless there's any more questions, Travis? There are no questions. Uh, thanks for paying attention. We will be back next week with something else. And, uh, Enjoy happy breaking.